Amen. Let's take the word of God this morning and turn, if you would, with me to Acts chapter 5. Acts chapter number 5. As you turn there, we're going to go back to chapter 4, read some of the last verses in chapter 4, and then go move on to chapter number 5 because they all go together. And so I want to go back, if you would, to verse number 31. And I want you to, and the best you can as you read, to try to picture in yourself what the church looked like at that time. The Bible says, verse 31, and when, chapter 4, verse 31, and when they had prayed, that's the people in the church, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. And Jos, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. Chapter 5, verse 1. But a certain man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a possession and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came, upon, uh, came on all them that heard these things. And the young men arose, wound him up, and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours that his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether ye sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them which have buried thy husband are at the door, and shall carry thee out. Then fell she down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in, and found her dead, and carrying her forth, buried her by her husband. And great fear came upon all the church, and upon as many as heard these Things. I would like to bring your attention for just a few moments on two verses. One is found in chapter 4, the other one in chapter 5. Verse 31 of chapter 4 says this, And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible tells us in the next verse they were of one heart. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. Go over to chapter 5, notice verse 3. And Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? There's two fillings there. One, chapter 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost. In chapter 5, Satan has filled the heart of Ananias. And he mentions here the heart being filled, the filling of the Spirit of God made the people of God of one heart. And so as we come to chapter 5, verse 1, I want to preach uh, this morning on this thought, and as you think about the great moving of God during that time in chapter 4, we see, as I talked about last week, a problem in the church. We saw at the beginning of chapter 4, the enemy from without, those who are persecuting the church, we come to chapter 5 and we see the enemy from within. But what is the issue here is explained to us in verse number 3. Why hath Satan filled thine 
heart to lie to the Holy Ghost. I want to preach a few moments this morning on, but the deceitful heart. But the deceitful heart. Now, I want you to think about this. Everything was going great in chapter 4. Revival. People were of one heart. Uh, They were filled with the Spirit of God. They were bringing their possessions and bringing them at the apostles' feet. There was a They were preaching the word of God with boldness, but the deceitful heart. I want to preach on that this morning. I want to give you three points, and I'm going to just share those three points, and then we're going to expand on that last point next week. But I want us to consider, first of all, as we think about the deceitfulness of the heart, let's consider, first of all, the praiseworthy circumstances. The praiseworthy circumstances. You see, when we come to chapter number 5, as I mentioned last week, we come to an interesting part in the life of the church, the first century church. We've seen a lot of firsts. It is the first time that the Holy Ghost has come down upon a group of people where they've spoken in uh, the languages of men, where people were hearing in their own languages the wonderful works of God. It was the first time in chapter 4 that you see the church being persecuted. There's the first record that we have, and we can learn from those things. And the first problem ever described in the church is found right here in Acts chapter number 5. And I believe we can learn some things, not just from the enemy from without, but now from the enemy from within. And as we look at the circumstances, we could say that Great things were happening. Remember, at the beginning of chapter number 4, they were being persecuted, and Peter and John were told not to preach nor teach in the name of Jesus Christ. And so Peter and John went back to their own company in verse 23 and 24, and their immediate response was not that of being carnal. It was that they prayed together. And so we commended their response. They prayed together, and We noted that their prayer was not just a prayer of, well, God, remove the persecution, remove the enemy, uh, help us to be, um, um, uh, to, uh, you know, if you would evade those who are persecuting us, none of that. What they asked was straightforward. It was, give us boldness to preach the word. A simple request, which we find that request to be granted in verse number 31. At the end, the Bible says, of verse 31, And they spake the word of God with boldness. God answered their prayer. Not only that, we see in the church a spirit of sacrifice. In verse number 32, when the multitude of them believed were of one heart and of one soul, what did they do? Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was was his own, but they had all things common. If you go over to verse 34, the Bible says, Neither was there any among them that lacked, For as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold. And so we noted here there is a spirit of sacrifice in the church. A great moving of God where people are taking care of the needs of one another in the church. And we see again great things happening. There was unity of heart, unity of spirit, a spirit of sacrifice that we also see in verse number 36 and 37 we see Barnabas being singled out for what he did. Now, the Bible makes it clear that many were selling their lands and their houses. But the Bible gives us the name of one man. Now, no doubt, because we would see him later, uh, no doubt seeing that he was a Levite, which is really interesting for the position he had, we find here that he brings a the money that he sold of the land, he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. So you see, great things are happening in the church. Uh, you see a people rejoicing, a people preaching with boldness, a people praying, all the things that we want to see in our church, right? I hope everybody nods their head right there. And so we look at the circumstances and we could say, hey, these are praiseworthy circumstances, which brings us to the second point, and that is right in the midst of the praiseworthy circumstances, we see, number two, the perfidious conduct. Now, if you don't know that word, that's just a fancy word for just saying deceitful. Perfidious. What did Ananias and Sapphira do? 
in the middle of these praiseworthy circumstances, how do we analyze their conduct? Uh, and again, I use the word perfidious, which means to be deceitful or to be untrustworthy. If you look at just at the surface of what they did, let's look at, if you would, just what they did without thinking about their deceit. They sold a possession that they owned. It was theirs. As many other people had done in the church, they did the same thing. Uh, the Bible tells us that a portion of what they sold the land for, the money, a portion of the money that they sold the land for, they kept it back for, them, for, the, for their own. Now, by the way, uh, nowhere were the believers instructed to sell their lands. Nowhere were the believers instructed to bring all the money. It's not commanded anywhere. They didn't have to do that. And so they did as everybody else did. They sold their land. They brought the money. They kept back part of that money. Nothing's wrong there, right? There's nothing wrong with that. However, the Bible tells us that they conspired together to keep back part of the price. They brought the money then publicly to the apostles' feet. And then we know, as I mentioned earlier, they were not forced to sell the possession and neither were they required to bring all of the money that they made. And so on the surface, in the midst of those praiseworthy circumstances, we, we, we could stop and say, wow, look at Ananias and Sapphira. They did a commendable thing. They sold their land. They made a sacrifice. They didn't have to do that. And they brought the money at the apostles' feet but however, we see that the Bible tells us in verse number two, and they kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. In other words, we make a connection with what Ananias and Sapphira did back with what Barnabas had done. Uh, chapter four closes with Barnabas bringing the money and laying it at the apostles' feet. When we come to chapter number 5, we find that Ananias does the same thing that Barnabas did. He brought the money in a public way at the feet of the apostles. However, his conduct was deceitful. It was not genuine. As I mentioned, it was perfidious. I want to notice several things about the deceitfulness. The first thing I want to note is, first of all, they're prompting... Their prompting was deceitful. We ask ourselves here, what is it that pushed them to do what they did? There is only two options. If you kind of boil it down and say there are two categories of why we do what we do, and it is evident as we look to chapter number four, that what the people did, what Barnabas did, he did because he was prompted by the Spirit of God. Uh, the Spirit of God tell, told uh, Barnabas, hey, sell your land. Uh, some of your brethren can use it. And so you go ahead and do that, sell your land, and bring back part of the price. And so we see their prompting was, uh, however, was deceitful because Ananias and Sapphira were not prompted by the Spirit of God. They were prompted by something else. Verse 1 says, but a certain man. The but makes a difference between what Barnabas did and what Ananias and Sapphira did. It lays a distinction between, right, those who were operating, being filled with the Spirit of God, being prompted by the Spirit of God, with here a man and his wife who are being prompted by something else. You see, Barnabas had been seen bringing the money at the, of his possession at the apostles' feet, uh, that is how we leave Acts 4. The language of Acts 5, 1 and 2 does not indicate that Ananias and Sapphira conspired when they received the money. In other words, I believe that even before they sold their possessions, they had intended on keeping back a part of the price. So it's not like, right, they sold their possession intending to give it all, and when they received the money... Then they said, well, you know what, let's keep back part of it. No, the conspiring took place before they even sold their land. 
That is what the text seems to indicate to us. And so they were not prompted by the Holy Ghost as other believers had been. They were moved or they were prompted by something or someone else. What is it that prompts us to do what we do for the Lord? Now, I, I don't want to analyze what we do for the Lord. I want to analyze and I'm concerned about what prompts us to do what we do for the Lord. Because on the surface, nothing Ananias and Sapphira did was wrong. They sold their land, they kept back on a part, part of the price, and they brought the majority of the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. There's nothing wrong with that on the surface in those acts. That's what everybody in the church had done. But the difference lies in what prompted them to do what they did. You see, what is the motivation that moves us to action? One commentator put it this way. He says, those who had sold their estates and laid the money at the apostles' feet, did it by the special impulse of the Holy Ghost, enabling them to do an act so very great and generous, and Ananias pretended that he was moved by the Holy Ghost to do what he did as others were, but he was not. And so we see here, first of all, their prompting was deceitful. Number two, we see that their plan was also deceitful. As we look at verse number 2, the Bible says, and they, when they sold their possession, they kept back part of the price. And the Bible says, his wife also being privy to it. Now, the word privy tells us that both Ananias and Sapphira were aware of the plan. They had discussed it. They had talked about it between both of them. Later on, when Sapphira comes into the church, the Bible says in... Um, Notice verse number 9, Then Peter said unto her, How is it that ye have agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? So they had talked among themselves, and they had determined how much they would keep for themselves. And so they set a motion in a plan, a plan to be deceptive, a plan that, as many of the people in the church had done, they had sold their lands, their houses, and uh, the believers in the church had brought all the entirety of their possession at the apostles' feet, Barnabas was one of them. And so Ananias and Sapphira thought to themselves, as they were being prompted, as they saw Barnabas do that, they thought to themselves, hey, we, we, we can maybe be like Barnabas. The apostles gave him a special name. He was Joe's, and the apostles kind of marked him and says, hey, we're going to call you Barnabas. Hey, if we do this, maybe we can have a special name, just like Barnabas did. They weren't led by the Spirit of God. They were prompted uh, by something else, and their plan was also deceitful because they wanted to make it appear as if they were being sacrificial, and maybe in part they even were. Remember, they were not forced to sell their land. But they wanted to, as Brother Town said last week, they wanted to take part in the sacrifice to receive the praise, but they really were not sacrificing as others had been. And so their plan was deceitful. Their prompting was deceitful. Their plan was deceitful. Thirdly, we see their performance was deceitful. Notice what happens, verse 2, and kept back part of the prize, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Can you see in your mind Ananias walking with the money? He's walking inside the church. Can you sense? Now, we, we, we know, but uh, we know. Uh, can you sense the pride? And Ananias, as he walks in, what, what is he about to do? He is about to bring publicly the money, and he is going to put it at the apostles' feet. Can, can you sense, can you feel that? Now, put yourself, we don't know the story. We're just living in the church. There's an exciting time going on, and people have been bringing, selling their possessions and their houses, bringing it at the apostles' feet. And here's another one. And Ananias, and there he comes. He walks in, and everybody's like, wow, look at that. Ananias is coming. He's got money. Uh, and uh, we, we think about it. We see that was all an act. And perhaps most of the people in the church thought, that's just regular. He's doing what everybody else has been doing. His performance might have been even perceived by some as a humble act. Yet it was the complete opposite 
He was seen, think about it, he would be seen laying the money at the apostles' feet. So I would imagine if we had the platform today, uh, the apostles here maybe were, uh, depending on what was going on in the service, and here Ananias comes, and the idea of laying at the apostles' feet is Ananias would come, and he would he would bring, come to Peter, and he would get down, and he would lay the money at the apostles' feet. He would bow down, and so people would look at Ananias and would say, wow, look at that humble man. Look at the sacrifice that he's made. Look at that man. He must be commended. Do you see him stooping down? Do you see him thinking about how everyone around him will praise him for his act of humility? And yet at the same time, he was oozing with pride. Ananias might have thought, everyone will want to be just like me. I am a role model for everyone. But he was not. You see, his performance was deceitful. His prompting was deceitful. His plan was deceitful. His performance was deceitful. But also we see, number four, their profit was deceitful. There is an expression we find twice, verse number two, the Bible says, and they kept back part of the price. Verse 3 says, But Peter said, And nice, why has Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back? Now the expression here, keep back, means literally this. It means to set apart. Another word that is used that you find in Titus is the word to purloin, which means literally to embezzle. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, that was their money. You're right, it was their money. But you remember what they did? They were pretending they were giving it all to God. So what they were doing in their very act, by pretending to bring all the money but keeping back out of the price, you know what they were doing? They were embezzling money. God's money. You see, it is something that word they kept back has the idea in the Greek word, in the Greek sense, it is to do something in a clandestine way. The Greek word is used only three times in the New Testament, twice here in Acts chapter number 5, and the only other time it is used, it is used in Titus chapter 2, verse 9, verse 9 and 10, where it says, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters, and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining. Don't steal from your employer. That's the idea. Don't embezzle money. Be a good servant of your master, but showing all good fidelity. So the only time that word is used, apart from Acts 5, is there in Titus chapter, and it has the idea of embezzling, taking something that does not belong to you. You see, the mindset, now remember the believers, uh, if you go back to chapter 4, notice verse, uh, uh, verse 34. Remember what the believers were saying in the church? Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the price of the things that were sold and laid them out at the apostles' feet and distribution was made uh, unto every man according as he had need. And back in verse 32 he says, And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul, neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own. You see, the mindset of the believers at that time was everything belongs to God. It doesn't belong to me. I am a... In the words of Jesus Christ, I'm a steward. Everything belongs to God. And God has entrusted me things in my life that I may use those things for His glory. And so you see what Ananias would say. Here's the different minds and here's what separates what Ananias did with what the other believers did in the spirit of the church is that the mindset of Ananias somewhere along the line changed. Where he thought now, not everything belongs to God. This part is mine. He kept back. He looked at his possessions and he says, this much belongs to God, but this belongs to me. And that is not the mindset of the first century church. Remember the mindset of the first century church is, nothing belongs to me. It all belongs to the Lord. And may what I have be used for the glory of God the Bible says in Ecclesiastes 5, verse 4, When thou vowest a vow unto God, 
defer not to pay it. For he hath no pleasure in fools. Pay that which thou hast vowed. God hath no pleasure in fools. You see, I think that we think about the perfidious conduct of Ananias and Sapphira, and we see the prompt, their prompting was deceitful, their plan was deceitful, their performance was deceitful, their profit was deceitful, but ultimately, they really thought that they could deceive God. That's what Peter said. Thou hast lied to the Holy Ghost. You've lied to God. You've not only deceived yourself, you've deceived the church. Uh, you've, uh, in your plans, you thought that this money belongs to you. And uh, the, 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 the worst is that you think you can deceive God. Boy, if that doesn't ring a bell with us, I don't know what will. You see, we can deceive people, some people, some of the time. We, we can deceive uh, people for a long time but we will never deceive God. And that's what Ananias and Sapphira thought they were going to get away with. They thought they were going to get away with deceiving God. Now, we see the praiseworthy circumstances. We see the perfidious conduct. But thirdly, we see the prevalent cause. What happened to Ananias and Sapphira? Why did they do what they did? What was the reason behind their perfidious conduct? Do we want to know why? Isn't it interesting that Peter asked that question twice? Notice verse 3. Peter said unto Ananias, Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to give back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Twice Peter asked the question to Ananias, Why? Why? You see, the heart is mentioned twice. Verse 3, verse 4. And I believe that the mention of the heart is of utmost importance to our understanding of this account. We must not just read this account as some just historical reference. We must approach this account asking ourselves a sobering question. What does this chapter teach me about myself? Are we aware that Ananias and Sapphira are no different than me and you? They're no different. They are just like me and you. Now, I know we look at this story it's like, wow, man, these people are bad. Perhaps we should say, what a good look at human nature. What a good look into the heart of man. You see, from what place, from what place did the thoughts of Ananias arise? Why was he deceitful? Why was he prompted by deceit? Why did he plan to be deceitful? Uh, why did he, uh, why was his performance deceitful? Uh, why all those things? Why did Ananias say, I will keep back part for myself. I will pretend that I gave all the money. I will be recognized for my sacrifice just as Barnabas did was. I will get away with this lie. You see, the problem with Ananias and Sapphira was not a, as I mentioned this morning in Sunday school, it was not a psychological problem. We must not only condemn the conduct of Ananias and Sapphira, but we must also confront the sinful nature of Ananias and Sapphira. You see, our society has a great problem today where all that the society does is, is analyzes the problems. And you go to the psychologist and the psychologist says, okay, well, that's the problem. Yep, that's what you do. Yep, that's what you do. Yep, okay, well, tell me. You lay on the couch and you tell me all your problems. You tell me all your behavior. And often you make an assessment of the behavior. And this is why. And often we say, well, this is what's wrong with you. Mate. And you're not thinking the wrong way. And we have to stop thinking that that's the great problem with the world. Why? Because you can take the most educated people in this world, the people who have the most knowledge, and yet there's something they have in very, very common to those who have very little knowledge. Martin Lowe joins, he said, people talk so much about psychology, 
but it is there that they are wrong. Because psychology simply means the understanding of people and their behavior in totality. Here in the Bible, and here alone, you get a true assessment of human nature and an analysis that reveals a profound psychological understanding that the thoughts that arise in the, in the mind of men come from the heart. And what society needs is not a new way of thinking. What society needs is a new heart that can only be found in the person of Jesus Christ. You see, it is not the mind, but the spirit, the heart, the deeper part of human nature that causes the trouble. And that is what is often forgotten today. And society tries to go into uh, some of the worst neighborhoods in of our country, and they try to deal with people in a psychological way. And they never deal with the spiritual issues. Our Lord Jesus Christ, if you turn with me in Matthew chapter number 15, in Matthew chapter number 15, if you go there with me, <clears throat> Jesus Christ here obviously spent much of his time uh, preaching and teaching, confronting the scribes and the Pharisees, and often he, he teaches some important truths, and one of those is found here in Matthew 15. And if we begin reading in verse number 16, the Bible says, And Jesus said, Are ye also yet without understanding? Verse 17, do not ye, ye yet understand that whatsoever entereth in at the mouth goeth into the belly and is cast out into the drought? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come forth from the what? The heart. And they defile the man. So we trace it back. The words, they defile the man. But where do the words come from? They come from the heart. See, what society deals is, well, you got to stop talking like that. Stop talking like that. Stop talking like that. Do better. Do better. You will never do better until the heart is changed. Verse 19, for out of the heart, here it is, proceed evil thoughts. That's why Peter looked at Ananias and said, why hath Satan filled thine heart? The lie to the Holy Ghost. He says in verse 4, Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Where did the deceit come from? In Ananias. It came from the heart of Ananias. Jesus says, For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. And, but to eat with unwashed hands defileth not a man. You see, the Jews of that day were making a big deal, right? About being clean, clean on the outside and polishing the outside and making sure that uh, the, you wouldn't put the wrong things in your body and make sure that you're washing your hands and washing your feet before you come into the household and all those things. And Jesus says, no, you've got it all wrong. Defilement comes from the heart. You ask ourselves, why did Ananias and Sapphira think that way? I'll tell you why they thought that way, because it was in their nature. The heart, as Jeremiah says, is desperately wicked above all things. Who can know? You know, what is interesting, if you go with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 14, in Isaiah chapter number 14, we, we ask ourselves here, what is, what is, who is this like? Well, if you turn with me to Isaiah chapter number 14, I will show you who this is like. The type of heart that we find that is uh, common in all of us. Notice Isaiah chapter 14. Let's begin reading in verse 12. The Bible says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which this week of the nations? For... Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the north. So what did Lucifer say? He says, uh, In his heart, 
You see, his heart was lifted up. Ezekiel 28, 2 says, Son of man, say unto the prince of Tyrus, Thus saith the Lord God, Because thine heart is lifted up, and thou hast said, I am a God. I sit in the seat of God in the midst of the seas, yet thou art a man and not God. Thou that set thine heart as the heart of God. What is the problem with man? The great problem with the heart of man is that he wants to be his own God. And guess what? When you're your own God, of course you can think and you can deceive God. You see, as we find the expression, why hath Satan filled thine heart? Great things happening in the church. I, I wanna, we're going to stop right here because I'm going to expand on that. I want to talk about why did Peter say, why has Satan filled thine heart? How does Satan fill our hearts? How do we conceive things in our heart? How does that happen? Now, I want to spend some time on that next week, but I, I want you to see here, we, we ask ourselves, the great moving in the church, right? The power of God. Boldness in preaching. Sacrifice among God's people. Unity of prayer and heart. Great spirit, a spirit of revival that we want to see in our church. What gets in the way? What's the enemy from within? But the deceitful heart. That, that goes down to the root, does it not? You can deal with all the superficial things, all the behavior, all the words. But what does it always come back to? The heart. Great revival, but the deceitful heart. May the Lord help us. You come back next week, I want to spend a little time talking about how that happens. How can our hearts be filled with the things that the devil wants our hearts to be filled with? And may the Lord help us with that. Let's, let's bow for a time of prayer. And I want to ask ourselves a few questions here as everybody bows their heads and closes their eyes. God, no doubt, wants to do great things in the church. It's the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. When God moves, nothing is going to get in the way. So how, what, what do we need to do? I'll tell you what we need to do. We need to pause, as God does here in Acts 5. And I'd like to summarize five by saying this, but the deceitful heart. That is me and you. God's power is unequaled. The group of believers here turned the world upside down by the power of God. We want the power of God. Sure, certainly we do. But the deceitful heart. What does greater damage to the church, I believe it is true of church history. What has done the greatest damage to the church is not the persecution of the saints. What has done the greatest damage to the church is the enemy from within. My and your heart. And so may the Lord help us to examine ourselves. 